So well, we're here with uh, Mr. Christian Cobb. Welcome back, everyone. It's a return on lifestyle show. And, uh, you know, we like to call it return on lifestyle because, you know, with your return on investment, if you're not using that return on investment to improve your lifestyle, then what's the really the point? And I think Christian does a great job at, uh, you know, embodying that, that notion that you should uh, use your investments to improve your lifestyle and, you know, kind of live the way you want to live. That's what I appreciate about you. Oh, thanks. And uh, so we're going to share your investor success story also. And I think we should jump into it. Uh, so Christian, you've been an investor for how long? Full-time 2016. So that's eight years. Eight years. Yeah, so full-time. Mostly in Southern Ontario. Yeah. Niagara region, um, Burlington, Mississauga. Got it. But primarily Niagara region, yeah. And what kind of properties do you have going on? Just roughly. Uh, small multi-units, duplex, triplex, fourplex, a um, couple of short-term rentals, which is like my favorite. Your favorite short-term rentals, like Airbnb yeah. stuff. Air, Airbnb, Verbo. Perfect. Yeah. So we're gonna, I want to jump into that. But before we do and get into the nitty gritty, uh, I, I, I like to challenge everyone when we first start with a, with a good story. Like a good one, like a scary one, a really funny one. Got to be real estate related. I, 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 I know the story I want you to tell, so I'm hoping you tell that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, it's not a good one. That's that's. But you learned sure. something, man. I I won't spoil it. Go for it. I don't know how much I've I've learned, but it, I've learned many many different lessons from that one. But um, I guess you're referring to my uh, triplex in St. Catharines with uh, some l less desirable tenants that I've had in there. Yeah, we all have we all have tenant story, bad tenant stories. I mean, it comes with the territory, in my opinion. Yeah. The, the analogy I have is like being a landlord in Ontario is like driving in Ontario. You could be the best driver in the world, but if you're driving here for 20 years, it's pretty hard to avoid yeah. a ticket or an accident. Yeah. You know I mean, as depending on how good you are. So you're a good landlord, but you ran into a tenant problem, but it was a special kind of tenant problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's just stuck. Well, to, to add to what you just mentioned, so it's it's a numbers game, right? Like yes. e if you've been an investor for eight years, you have mul multiple properties, multiple units or doors, uh, your, your tenants are coming and going, turnover, renos, this and that. So at some point, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how good things are going, I mean, my, my fame to my claim to fame was always like, well, I haven't been to the LTB yet. I haven't been to the LTB yet. Landlord and tenant board. Yeah. I haven't been to the landlord tenant board yet. And boy, did I jinx myself because I ended up going to the LTB and it was, it wasn't pretty, but, uh, I, I don't know where the story starts, but, um, so let's just say they, they, I'm guessing here, they probably stopped paying the rent at some point. No, interestingly enough, that's not really how it started. I think I think the way it started was it, so it's a triplex in St. Catharines. Yeah, oversized lot. It's actually the biggest the the biggest property I own. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it's like eighty by one seventy two or something. So it's a it's a really nice lot, huge backyard. Um, and uh, and these gentlemen, uh, decided to slowly but surely start building structures in, in the backyard. Wow. Yeah. So gazebos and canopies and, uh, uh sheds. Do like camping in there or storing things? Well, over time it turned into like a Canadian style tent city. Oh, and I'm saying that because like everybody's probably seen like images of tent cities in the States, like LA or whatever. So I had that in my backyard, just like a Canadian version. So it's a little bit nicer. A little bit more robust, you know? <laughs> Canadian version of Kent City. So were they like renting them out or they're having their like, you know, undesirable friends stay there too? I, I, I honestly, I didn't, I didn't know that we would talk about this. So, I mean, it's, it's all coming back now, but, oh, so, so yeah, it started with that. And basically there are two individuals that were renting the biggest unit. And uh, let's just say, during COVID, um, they were introduced to circles that I wasn't aware of that they were in these circles. 
So I guess they got at some point got introduced to certain drugs mm. and then it went south and it went south so fast. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I've never seen people who, you know, were part of society, contributed to society, had jobs. I've never seen like normal people in, in, in quotes. I've never seen normal people decline so fast and so uh, intensely or extremely. But yeah, so... So you place these tenants, like you... Yeah, I, I place them. Yeah, I, I, I place them myself. So they, I can't blame a property manager. Like I, I so didn't place them. them. They were just, as you say, normal people. You did a background check, an application. Yeah, everything. They were just normal people. Yeah. And during COVID, they started hitting some drugs, like what do we call it? Fentanyl, that kind of stuff. I, in the uh, halfway through at some point, that's where it, it went. Oof. So... So I knew, I knew they liked to party on weekends and, and like, I, I don't know, I don't judge people. They, they, they were good people. As a matter of fact, like I, I can even show this to you in the very beginning, they took care of that entire place. Like the, there were flowers and, and, you know, uh, gardens and like, it, it was a nice place. It attracted, it attracted good people. And the other two tenants were uh, Colombian immigrants uh, off the boat immigrants and they were all happy, happily living together. They, they, it, it was like love, peace, and harmony. It was, it was un, unbelievable. And yeah, and then you know fentanyl slash meth slash crack, and then yeah, it got really bad. It got, it got completely out of control. I mean, my my videos are are on YouTube, and people can look it up if they want to. What's the YouTube handle? Uh, my my name Christian Kelp. So yeah. Christian K A L B. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I'm not trying to like it, it's it's just for to raise awareness. Th this is not something I'm proud of. Obviously, I, I want pe this is this this series is really about exposing what's made people successful as investors in real estate. And I haven't met, oh, I've met very few people in real estate who've enjoyed success that haven't had trials and tribulations and big ones. You own it. It's, it's almost like a rite of passage that you must handle these things in order for the, 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 the gods of real estate to hand you success and wealth and cash flow. You have to be able to deal with this crap. So I want you to tell people the crap so it either scares them away or prepares them for what's coming mm -hmm. if they want to be successful also. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, there, there's no success in real estate without like adversity. Mm -hmm. There isn't. It's it's all. It's just a. It's just a scam. If you run into people like that, yeah, no, they're. It's a scam. We all straight up. We'll get there in a second. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, but wait. So you had triplex, couple of good tenants, couple of normal guys who go off the rails with drugs during COVID, turn your backyard into Canadian version of tent city with a bunch of other undesirables doing drugs. Well, that, that's basically what happened. So it, it started to attracting, right? Law of attraction started to attract all these like, uh, okay, I have to watch my language, but uh, very undesirable individuals. And then um, it just got progressively worse, but fast. So when somebody says like, oh yeah, well, wh why didn't you inspect the place like every month or something? It's like, I would, I would be away for four or five days because I don't, I don't live in St. Catharines, obviously. Four or five days, I go back and it's a signif significantly worse. So it turns out one of the two was basically like a hoarder, but not an inside, like uh, a traditional hoarder who hoards content in his house. He was hoarding everything outside. So free, free stuff on Kijiji, free stuff on Facebook Marketplace, free materials left on the curb, like anything you can imagine, like... And when I say that, I mean it. I'm not exaggerating. Anything you can imagine was in my backyard and tons of it. So I think people have a grasp of the problem now. Now, I, at some point, these people stop paying the rent. Yeah, at some point, they stop paying. And then at some point, I, I had to reach out for help because I've never been in that position before. But, but let's define the problem here. So they stop paying the rent. There's crazy people living in sheds in the backyard. They're doing drugs. Literally, literally living in, in, yeah, in the backyard. They're living, sleeping there, doing drugs. Yeah. Got these people in the house hoarding crap outside, doing drugs. But then he's, the, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, the other good tenants that were there is Colombian folks, nice mm -hmm. folks. They mm -hmm. must have left. So yeah, so they were very, very patient for the longest time. But then they both 
you know, teamed up and decided to um, move out on the same day. I don't, I don't blame them. And that was the beginning of the end. The, the day they moved out, that's when shit got really out of control. Okay. Yeah. This is turning into a Netflix series here. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. What, uh, what does out of control mean? Uh, there's lots of stories from people getting stabbed um, in my backyard, st parties, raves in the front yard, cops calling me at 5 a.m. multiple times, uh, six police cruisers showing up. Um, where it got really bad for me personally is when they started to break into the other two units. And not only did they break into those units, but they ended up renting it out to their squatter friends. So I would show up at the house and, and I see lights on in the other two units in the basement unit and the back unit. And, uh, actually not, not only lights, I saw windows boarded up too. So like, okay, great. Like uh, they must've broken in. So call the cops, wait for the cops and then go in there and, and kick them out. And like, I've had to do that a few times. Wow. Yeah. And I actually had to break into my own units because they changed the locks. So I had to break in through the window myself. I didn't know if somebody was in there or not. The cops were literally helping me push me through the window, like lift me up and push me through the window. I mean, I, there's so many stories. I can't even like get everything uh, organized okay. in my head right now. We're, we're getting, a, we're getting a summary here. It's, it sounds like the cops were uh, at least somewhat helpful for you. Um, yes and no. Yeah. They're doing what they can. There were good ones. And there were ones that just didn't, they couldn't care less. And they're like, yeah, no, this is not a problem. But when they broke into the other two units, they did help. They did help me as far as like, they said, okay, this is a separate address. It's a separate unit, but anything in the backyard, anything inside that unit, any, you know, there were, there were vehicles that showed up from, from accidents that were smashed up. I mean, there was so many things that happened. Um, and the cops just like, they got used to, showing up at the house, they were just like, yeah, this, this house again, this place again, these idiots again. They, so I think they call those frequent flyers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was the, uh, the lucky owner. Right. <laughs> and yeah, it, it just got completely out of hand. Like, um, you know, bylaw that that's when I learned a lot too, when it came to city bylaw. And, um, so long story short, after multiple warnings and, oh, clean this up, clean that up, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I can't clean it up because if I show up and I start cleaning up their, their content, they, they threaten to sue me because it's their, it's their stuff, right? This is, this is the country we live in. This is the province we live in. So I'm trying to communicate this to the city and whatever. And, and uh, one day they basically ended up showing up with a backhoe. So I had a this city, the city of St. Catharines was in my driveway with a backhoe going back and forth, removing stuff. Perfect. Yeah, it was perfect. But they, they made, uh, they made all these claims like, hey, we're going to clean this up and whatever. And then once they showed up and my, my, uh, my tenants were there, they defended, you know, the, the structures, let's just say, right. Oh man, it's just nuts. It's just nuts. And and long story short, they didn't end up touching the structures. I can just I can just picture them like chaining themselves to the structures. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. And multiple hot tubs too. They would like lie on a hot tub, like, no, oh, you're not taking this. That's why. Yeah, they had multiple hot tubs too. I, I forgot some of the details, but like Okay. Eventually you got rid of all these people and structures and nonsense. Hi, yeah, hired a paralegal based on recommendation. I'm not going to name names. Um, had some creative ideas tried. I'd, and, and this is for people to know, like I'm, I'm not some schmuck. Like I, I tried things. I, I tried to find solutions outside of the system and they kind of failed, um, miserably. So I ended up hiring a paralegal and that's how I got, uh, I, I got to understand the system, the LTB paralegals, um, adjudicators and all that stuff. Interesting. Okay. But yeah, so eventually it took 11 months. It took 11 months to get them evicted. Perfect. That's where I was getting to. So 11 months of all this madness and what could have been a, a, a nice Netflix series. Uh, yeah. now it's solved. Now, now I'm putting you on the spot. If you were to boil it down here, 
but really what was the core lessons that you learned from this? Even though some of these things are not your fault and you're outside of your control, mm -hmm. there has to be a lesson, right? Um, there's, there's lots of valuable lessons. Uh, one of the main lessons is I should have, um, I should have taken action much, much sooner. Cash for keys, like hire, hire a paralegal, but don't hire a paralegal to, you know, fill out all these stupid forms and submit them to the LTB. Like, no, you hire a paralegal, draft up a letter, cash for keys, make them multiple offers, right? Like staggered, staggered offers. The sooner you move out, the more you're going to get mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and get them out. I, it, it, not only would I, I would have saved so much money, but like, the, can you imagine the stress and, and the uncertainty of not knowing if this place is going to blow up, right? Like burn down. Um, and by the way, that property is surrounded by seven neighbors because it's a big property. So can you imagine like the emails and the text messages and, you know, the neighbors, and it, it was, it was intense. So I imagine some of them were obviously upset, but were they, were they understanding and helpful? Um, for the most part, they, they understood like that my hands were tied and that I was trying to do everything, but they were frustrated, right? Super yeah. frustrated. I, I mean, the parties and like, there, there was some really intense stuff that happened there, but to get back to the lessons learned. So, uh, take action sooner. Um, think outside of the box. Don't necessarily listen to, to professionals in their field because they have their own, uh, uh agendas. agendas. <laughs> um, that, that was a big one for me. Um, what, what other lessons did I learn? I mean, the screening, I, I could have, it's interesting. I usually do a really good job at screening and a lot of people come to me to get advice. I, I do feel like one of the lessons learned is that I should have listened to my gut because my gut at the time was telling me something was off, but on paper, everything was good. And I think, um, when I look at like eight years of real estate investing, like full time, I, I started investing before that, right? When I had, uh, when I was part of the corporate world. But when I look back, like every time I didn't listen to my gut, I, it was a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. That's profound because it's hard to quantify gut feelings because sometimes gut feelings, you act on them and they seem wrong, mm -hmm. but over a period of time, they become right. Mm -hmm. It's your faith you know, almost like a, a godly faith that you need in yourself and yeah. making the right decision. It's, it's hard to do. It is hard, but, but, and it, it sounds cheesy. It sounds, you know, may, maybe some listeners are maybe confused by it, but it's a, it's a hundred percent. It's a real thing. And, uh, in this case, I would say fundamentally, that was the mistake I made in, in the very beginning. Right. So not trusting your gut feeling, uh, not problem solving quickly and aggressively enough. Aggressively enough, yeah. Yeah. And anything else? It's okay if there's nothing. Um, I, I, I think, I think that's, I think, well, and, and the other thing is like l learned about the system and how the system is a complete joke. Mm. Um, LTB, adjudicators, the, the tenant board, right? It's not the landlord tenant board, it's the tenant board. They, 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 they need to rename that, uh, they need to rebrand altogether. Um, and I, I have some stories too, if, if we have time for the, for that, because, uh, I, I learned a lot of lessons there, uh, how the paralegals have the most secure small businesses in, in Canada, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and no offense, you know, everybody's got to make a living. Everybody's got to put food on the, on, on the table. So, so, you know, I, I support small businesses. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I learned a lot of things. You know, there, those important, those are, those are very important lessons. And like, I, I obviously can't quantify this, but I, I find like you, you, you find the problem, the size of the, the problem you deal with is congruent with the size of the lesson that you need to learn. Yeah. The universe or God, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. has a way of teaching you lessons that way. So yeah. if, if you have that awareness and you, you know, you think, you know, God or the universe or whatever spiritual you think you follow for the, for the tough stuff, mm -hmm. that that's inevitably the lesson. Yeah. So, and that's interesting that you brought that up. So 
one thing that I learned towards the end, like not the end exactly, but um, and it ties into what you just mentioned, is that if you cannot control it, you cannot stress over it, like lose sleep and like, you know, think about it 24 seven and somehow, and I don't know where it came from or what happened, but at some point I, I just learned like some, something gave me that strength to almost like not wipe it out of my, my brain, but I, I was able to like, you know what, everything's going to be okay. This is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Instead of like, every, you know, everyone, every time I talk to somebody, I was like, how can you deal with this? Like, oh, I, I will, you know, blah, 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 all these things, right? And uh, I, at some point I just came to, to terms that it's a test. It was, it was a, a pretty intense test, but it was a test and, and I'm, I'm being tested right now and I can't freak out. I can't lose my mind. I can't have sleepless, sleepless nights over and over and over and lose, you know, five years of my lifespan yeah. because of the, the, the issues that these people have. And, and that also ties into another thing that I learned is like, I got to a point where I didn't blame them. I, as a matter of fact, I feel, so, I felt sorry for them. So you, you, you went the full circle. Yeah. So you see how important this is. This is why when I talk about it, this is the core, the essence of investor success story, because, you know, on social media and, and I'm, I'm guilty of it too, of course, it is social media. You hear success. Hey, Paul got another property or his client did this and all these great things, but nobody hears this. Yeah. These are the mountains you have to climb mm -hmm. in order to get the pot of gold. Yep. Yeah. Right. You can't have the pot of gold without this stuff. So I'm glad you went through it. Mm -hmm. I'm happy you came out of it. I'm even happier you learned the lesson and I'm happy even, even more happier if you could be that way that you're sharing it here. So, but now let's break it down for everyone who's like, holy shit, I'm never investing in real estate again. <laughs> if you're thinking that right now, don't invest in real estate ever again. Leave it all for us, please. Because those who are willing to solve problems are always going to make the most money and have the most effect, the best ROI and ROL. Uh, you bought this property. You don't have to give exact numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, what year? 2015. It was my, it was my first property in uh, St. Catharines or Niagara. Okay. And at the time I didn't know nothing. I had knew nothing. Barely anything. 2015 triplex, roughly how much did you pay? Um, so it was, it was a duplex with, it was a, du uh, a duplex with an extension. Um, it was 244, 244. 244,000 mm -hmm. for this three unit property. And then in today's dollars, 22, wait, wait, 20, February. 2024. Yeah. I would, and I mean, this is what I do. You tell me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. I'd say that property is probably worth somewhere in the high six, low 700,000. Probably much higher. Okay. Tell me. I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly because the market is a little uh, funky right now, but um, I mean, it's a three bedroom unit. Uh, legal ADU. So I did a, I did an ADU in the basement, like a, yep. a legal conversion. So that's a, a really nice one bedroom. And then there's another one bedroom extension in the back, but it's kind of like a small semi because it has a basement and the upper. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, 850 maybe. Okay. Fair. Let's, let's, let's be super conservative. Mm -hmm. I said seven, you said 850. Let's go 750. Sure. Let's, yeah. Conservative is always good. So in 2015, this is 2024, let's say that's nine years. Yeah. You essentially, the value of this property triple. Mm -hmm. 244, say that's 250 yeah. to 750. Mm -hmm. You know, you've made 500,000 year in equity gain. Never mind paying down the mortgage. Mm -hmm. Never mind, probably, and don't, don't even answer this question, probably had multiple opportunities to refinance the property. Mm -hmm extract equity, make other investments, improve your lifestyle. Yeah. And the cost of that was an initial down payment. The, I don't know else to say this, the balls to actually do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. And the universe had to teach you a lesson. You go screening and about how to take, take in charge of problems along the way. So you learned an important life's lesson and made 500 G's in equity in nine years. I think you did pretty good. Yeah. I guess so. 
Congratulations. Thanks, man. All right. <laughs> so now that that story's out of the way, so I, I want to know who Christian is. So Christian, uh, Cobb, we say that, right? Yeah, Cobb, Cobb, whatever. Cobb, Cobb, okay, sure. Whatever works for you. Uh, a, a very, uh, very German name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you, I don't, don't, you, were, you weren't born in Canada. No, I was born in Thunder Bay. Born, okay, born in Thunder Bay, but moved to Germany when I was eight. Moved to Germany when you were eight. Eventually moved back to Canada. Yeah, with like detour. Yeah. With some detours. Yeah, some other countries in between. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what, I know what it is, but tell, you were, you were in the travel industry, right? Uh, airline industry. Yeah. It's uh, when I moved from Australia to Ireland, I, uh, I met up a friend of mine that I used to work with in Florida, got hired at American Airlines in Dublin. He told me, come over, you can fly for peanuts. And, uh, and then I, yeah, I flew over, got the job lived there, got into the airline industry, and then I got transferred to uh, Toronto in 2006. Okay, so Canada sucked you back in. Yeah, no, that was the goal. The goal was to come back. It was always the goal to come back, yeah. But, and, and you started investing in 2050. Uh, no, the first property was 2008 in um, Mississauga. Oh, wow. So you've been investing for a long time. Yeah, but at the time, it didn't feel like investing. It was just like firstborn didn't want to rent. I refused to pay rent. But you were renting it out? Uh, no. So what happened was when the second one was on the way, um, I found out about like refinancing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was not very savvy when it, when it comes to all the stuff that we know today that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I barely knew anything. Sure. And I, I came across, well, rich dad, poor dad, just like anybody else. And then another book that I got at some conference somewhere. And uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's not, it's not a popular book, but it talked about refinancing and pulling out equity mm -hmm. and buying like a second property. Ding, and when ding, 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 ding. I, I'll never forget it. Like I, I was like, wow. So I looked, we looked into that because we needed a bigger home. The Mississauga property was a semi, like a smaller semi yeah. in Streetsville. So you're living there with your family. Yeah. And it didn't feel like an investment. It was more like, yeah, like a, like a family home. Mm -hmm. But um, once the, you know, the light bulb went off, it's like, okay, this is going to be my first rental property. Right. Nice. So we bought, uh, I bought a place in Burlington, like a detached. And you kept that one. And kept that one. And that was my first rental. So okay. that was my first uh, experience as a landlord. Okay. Well, I mean, you, you kind of got in, but you wanted to do it. You refinanced. That makes sense. Uh, uh, but what? You know, at some point, there's a decision to want to do more. Like nobody aspires to be, wakes up and as a kid, like, hey, what do you want to do, little Johnny? Nobody says, I want to be a real estate investor and deal with, you know, meth heads in my backyard, building shelters. Like nobody dreams of that. People generally yeah. fall into it. It's, it's a pathway. It's a means to an end. It's a, it's a calling somehow. Like uh, briefly, uh, you know, uh, I, when, when I was, um, what, 19? You know, I was, I was living with my grandparents, had no real direction. I knew I wanted to become a fireman, which I did, and then retired. But I just started reading books. And I don't know if you guys can see it on camera, but there's, you know, a few hundred books here and more that are stacked away. And, and then, I, you know, like you, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is kind of right here in a piles of other ones. And that led me to do, go to some conferences. I ended up going to California by myself mm -hmm. to this conference called Never Work Again. And it was all about how to generate passive income streams so you never have to work again, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not how it works, but you know that's how they watch. That's how they get you in. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I I was 23 years old, and I'm sitting there in this conference, and the first day you kind of get in, and I had no money, right? I had spent everything I had to get there. It was a stupid plane ticket, and then there was a forum, and uh, I ended up hooking up. Uh, with someone else who wanted to share a room because I couldn't afford the room by myself. So I had like kind of one dude kind of sharing a room mm -hmm. and then and I had this room. So like he was taking a shower, I'd leave and then come back, have breakfast and he was done, he'd leave and I I'd do kind of like <laughs> the things you do to kind of make it in the world. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we're at this conference and the first day everyone's in there. There's gotta be close to a thousand people there from all over the world, whatever. And they start doing this thing. Like everyone 
under 30 stand up. And then 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23. And it's me in like the back left corner and some other kid in like the top right corner. I'm like, please, please don't let me be the youngest guy here. And they say, okay, 22. And I sat down and the kid stayed up. And they're like, oh, yeah, he's the youngest guy. He's here. Come on stage. I'm like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is I was young and I had no clue what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And the, at this conference, yes, they were teaching about passive income streams, but each presenter would, has something to sell. So you had a guy talking about like how to set up like 300 vending machines. So I have all this passive. Yeah, well, yeah. At the end, at the end of the talk, he'd like, well, ATMs probably hey, so you can buy my program and I can yeah. teach you how to do it. So whatever, I was learning about sales. Yeah, I could sort of appreciate it now. So I didn't buy anything, but I left and uh, with a couple of things. I'm like, passive income can do this because I wasn't something about this working nine to five thing was like, this doesn't make sense to me. So I'm like, if I develop cash flow, I can make passive income. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, how do you make cash flow? Real estate. That's it. Mm -hmm. So that's all I left with. So I fly back home and then, you know, I'm like, okay, I got this thing in the back of my head and blah, blah, blah. And then I ended up becoming a fireman, get distracted. And then I bought my first property. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the long point I'm trying to make is everyone has that, that crux, that moment where you're like, what the hell drove you to mm -hmm. want to do this and be a landlord? Like, what was it for you? Like what, you know? What, what was the thing, the thought, the book, the this, the event, the, 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 the situation? Like what, what was it that the, the straw that broke the camel's back? I, yeah, I, I, think, I think there were, there were multiple moments like that maybe. But um, when I look back, I, I always knew like, and I don't, know how to, I don't know how to say this. I don't want to sound arrogant, but I always knew I was different. Mm -hmm. I, I always look like I'm a pretty good observer and I'm always like looking around and it started early on in school and I'm sitting there and it's like, like, well, what am I doing here? Like, what is this? This is all weird. This doesn't make any sense. I don't feel like you belong. No, it, it was always this, like going back to a gut feeling, right? Like I always had this gut feeling about many things and, and, uh, and then, yeah, so I'm in, in, in the corporate world and it never felt right. Mm. It never felt right. And, uh, and I ended up getting, I ended up getting a decent job that I actually kind of liked because it was, I was able to travel all over the world and whatever. But what I noticed is the harder I worked, the, the better I performed, the more I, the more I produced, the more I got milked mm. by, by, you know, the, uh, the owner of the company or the small business. And I think, um, that was kind of like in the back of my, my head, like this whole time. So I just started doing research, 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 you know, like, stuff like that you talked about going to conferences, going to trade shows, uh, online books, this and that, whatever. And, uh, the, the common denominator was always real estate. It was always real estate success stories, long term, like long-term success, right? Like short-term success never interested me. Mm. Right. When it came to long-term success, I noticed the common denominator was always real estate. And then, you know, most of the rich people in the world, real estate first, then as a foundation, then bre breach out, branch out into other industries, right? Yeah. But I think I think when it really hit me is when my uh, when my uh, mom passed away, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, four years later, my dad passed away. They passed away in Germany, so uh, I'm a single child, so I had to fly there, deal with it, um, and, and there were there was a lot of time to reflect on not necessarily my life, but on their lives, mm -hmm. sitting by myself in this house that they built this, this, uh, dream house. Like it was like a log home that they imported from Finland in, in Germany. Really? That was like my dad's dream. I think that was his way of bringing Canada to Germany because he lived here for 23 years. He liked Canada. He loved it. Really? Yeah. He loved it. Um, he, he escaped from communism, right? So that version. He loved that version. He would not like the current version of it because he escaped from, from communism in 1964 from East Germany. So I, I think you can... I can extrapolate. Yeah. And I'm not going to get into all the details, but yeah. So I had time to 
I'm sitting there by myself in this house and, and I had time to reflect on their lives and it hit me. It's like this whole retirement thing is a scam. It's a scam, right? Um, also like the pension and the government pension and how they had to like, uh, let, let's like, they were doing okay. They weren't like barely sort like just surviving, but I could, I could just tell that retirement is a scam and, and that fixed income is a scam, like fixed pension, right? Inflation, all of that stuff. And it just hit me and I'm like, I got to get, I, I got to get my shit together. And I didn't know exactly what action I had to take, but I knew I had to take action and I knew it had to be real estate. Okay. Well, that's what it is. That's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. So I think everyone that goes down this journey who ends up pursuing this and, you know, wanting to acquire that many properties, there's always that, that piece there, that story. So I like to ask people that because there's people listening at hood who will listen, uh, who, who, who are in that reflection stage or just before it, mm -hmm. they're sitting at their job saying, I hate this goddamn place. Why do I do? How do I get out? Yeah. Paul's successful real estate, Christian's successful real estate. They had, they were lucky. Mm -hmm. They had it better, but no, we all went through the same thing. We all went through that pain where you had to make a decision and pivot and shift into something that felt very risky, that felt very uncomfortable, where you were putting yourself out there, where you had to put your ego aside and become vulnerable mm. in order to make something better of your life. It was not comfortable. You had to ditch comfort to kind of go get what you want, right? Yeah. And, and then you learn over time that the, that comfort zone, right? Like comfort when, zone is where dreams go to die. Yeah. And, and whenever you feel like you've, you made it and things are good, you put your feet up, the universe will let, will remind you that it's not the case, right? Yeah. This is, this is, I learned, I mean, I, I kind of knew that, but even I got comfortable in a place and mm -hmm. that's what I learned when I went to this, uh, I mean, I, I told you all about it. Uh, the men's retreat thing I did in 2023 in mm -hmm. California is that embracing that, that difficulty yeah. just makes you so much more powerful. Mm -hmm. And then once you really embrace it, you're like, you know what? Come on, come get me. Bring it on. Yeah. Like come get me. <laughs> like seriously. And you, and you believe it inside. Yeah. These problems that you thought were eight problems mm -hmm. they become four problems. Mm -hmm. And when everyone's crying and whining and making excuses, you're like, shut up. Hey, shut up. What do you want? You don't like it? Yeah, Canada. All these things happen in Canada. Mm -hmm. We know what they are. 2020 and beyond. Things got not so good. But in the grand scheme of things, are they any better anywhere else? No, and they're, they're declining in, in, in all Western Western legacy countries, right? You're just trading your, these problems for different ones. And maybe different problems are better for you. I'm not judging anyone mm -hmm. who makes a decision because I've uh, thought about it. But if you're going to stay here, and I'm, I'm talking about a specific type of conversation where people have excuses, like why make those excuses? Mm -hmm. At some point you have to shut up, stop complaining and actually do stuff about it. Yeah. Or leave. So that's the realization I had. Like if you're hanging around people who all they do is complain and I get it. We all complain and have water cooler talk and oh my God, the Leafs suck or the Raptors suck or, you know, this politician sucks and this and that. It's, yeah, it's fine. But when it's happening day to day to day, month to month to month. Well, it's bad energy, right? You're, it is. You're, you're manifesting your, your thoughts, right? You're manifesting you're, your own destiny. Yeah, but you're manifesting your own destiny. They say complainers attract more things to complain about. And if you're whining, you're just attracting more things to whine about. So, you know, I, I, I it just, it was a mental shift for me to just say, you know what, bring it, I don't care. Just bring it on. Mm -hmm. It just takes power away from that. Mm -hmm. It's a back on you. Right? I think you did a lot of that too. And I want other people to do it. Now, okay. So you got a bit of your origin story. So, you know, what are some strategic things you've done in real estate, you know, let's say recently, Mm -hmm. that are uh, giving you the best bang for your buck, like the best ROI, mm -hmm. but also the best ROL, right? You talked about short-term rental, maybe that's it, but don't let me put words in your mouth. Tell me like what, what strategically are you doing that's working for you now? Well, that's the one thing that uh, 
thankfully I, I, I got this from the very first day. And when I, when I made the decision, I'm, I'm doing this real estate thing full time. Uh, the, the emphasis was always on cash flow. And uh, what does cash flow mean to you? Positive cash flow. What does that mean to you? That means the, the money that's left over at the end of the month, after all your expenses have been covered, um, that's positive cash flow. And the more you have that, the more cash flow you have, the more, uh, the more options you have, right? Because at the end of the day in life, when it comes to living the life on your terms or whatever you want to call it, it, it comes down to options, right? And cash flow gives you options. Mm -hmm. Right. It gives you, it gives you that extra insurance <laughs> policy, so to speak. Right. But, um, I've always focused on cash flow from day one. I always knew that at some point there's, you know, things cannot go up forever. Right. And, um, this whole conversation about equity and appreciation and everything, like I, I get it. I'm, I'm, you know, as an investor, you obviously look into that. You, you talk about it, you think about it. But primarily, I think the focus has to be on cash flow, mm -hmm. like like all the time, every deal, everything you look at, everything you do. Yeah, I, I I tend to agree with you. Like my my explanation is more nuanced, but let me tell you, see if I understand you. So if you're doing a real estate deal, regardless of what tactic, you know whether it's a multifamily or Airbnb or rent to own or whatever it is, mm -hmm. is to focus on making sure this deal or property cash flows that. The rent you generate is more than your expenses every month. Yeah, pr primarily. So, so as far as certain strategies like small multi-unit, right, duplex, triplex, fourplex, <laughs> um, short-term rentals are great if you know what you're doing. If you if you get if you buy in the right location, you don't have Karen neighbors next door. So, like, you really need to know what you're doing, especially you know now that it it, it became like this trend. This this like this cool thing to do is become an Airbnb host. But anyway, that's a whole different conversation. But um, no, I think, I think what I was re referring to is when you buy that property, whether it's like, yeah, it can be a rental and it can be a student rental, whatever, but like pay attention to like the size of the lot. Are you able maybe in, maybe not today, but are you able to build an addition in five years, 10 years in the future? Is the lot big enough to do that? Is it zoned for that? Can you, is there maybe, you know, a basement that you can turn into a unit, right? Or like, don't get like this, the tiniest little lot and then you're maxed out. Like, what are you going to do with it? Like, wh what options do you have in the future, right? Even if that cash flows, I, and I made these mistakes, right? I, I, I purchased a property like that before mm -hmm. and uh, we ran it as an Airbnb in Port Dalhousie. It was, it was amazing. Like it was, it was a cash cow. It was going extremely well. It was like a small kind of single family cabin. And we, we squeezed every penny out of that thing. Um, it had a pool, it had a hot tub. I, I learned a ton, but um, long story short, the, the neighbors didn't appreciate it at some point. And then we came to the, it, it came to that moment where we had to like, this was with a joint venture partner. And we sat down and said, well, what else can we do with this property? Where you couldn't do Airbnb. <laughs> We, the city was on our case. It, it was different times back then. Like now you can get licensing and stuff like that. Like now the, it, it seems a, there's more options to maybe extend that Airbnb, you know, period. Mm -hmm. But back then it was a, it was a, it, we had to make a decision. It was more wild west back then. It was more wild west and uh, it got out of control. Like when, when I pulled into the driveway, there were neighbors that would literally come over into like step on my driveway and confront me and like Karen's right. Like the modern day Karen's and we had to make a decision. We literally had to make a decision say, what, what do we do? Say, well, there's nothing else we can do. You, you can't add on top. You can't add in the back. It didn't have a basement that we could convert. Mm -hmm. And that was the lesson I learned in that transaction. It's like, you know, as much as it was, as it was about cash flow and a it cash flowed, yes, but it got to a point where there were there were no other options. There was nothing else we could could do with it. Yeah, I I agree with you. I'm actually making a video right now specifically about this, and it's the title is going to be the number one uh, mistake investors make, and it really has to do with having a backup plan. 
Yeah. And have, having insurance in your investment. And I don't mean, you know, fire and property insurance. I mean, having an insurance on your strategic investment. Yeah. Like if your plan is to Airbnb this, my question to you is, what is your backup plan yep. if this doesn't work? Yeah. If you don't have an answer, well, you're going to end up telling exactly the same story Chris is telling right now. Yeah. Right. And that goes for anything. You're like, hey, I'm going to buy this duplex and there's a garage in the back. I'm going to convert it to a triplex and it's going to be an ima- a great investment. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's your backup plan if it doesn't work? Well, Paul, it is going to work because the zoning allows for it. And I've done my due diligence with the city mm-hmm. and I have a zoning verification document to prove that. Okay. Well, there's your backup plan. Yeah. Right. That's different. But I get what you're saying. And that's my problem with Airbnb in Canada. I know it can work. It's just, I, I just on a totally personal level, I would, I would, I, we actually help people do Airbnbs all the time, but on a personal level, I won't do it here because for all the work we have to do, it's not, it doesn't give me bang on my buck. I'd rather do it in a, in a uh, market that actually wants Airbnbs. And they're like, yeah. please do this for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's markets that want to do that internationally. Anyway, that's another story. Okay. So Airbnb, the ones you do have are working for you really well. Yes. And I'm assuming the, uh, the other properties you have that are small multifamilies do yep. duplex, triplex, fourplex are also working well too. Maybe mm-hmm. they don't have as much cash flow, but they're probably, I, and I'm assuming here, tell me if I'm wrong, probably a little bit easier to manage. Yeah. I mean, th- there were a lot of lessons that I learned with, with this, you know, the, when multiple households share one address, one building, one driveway, one roof, one roof um, there's, it, there's a whole, like, you know, there's a whole area of potential problems. Yeah. So I've dealt with all of those problems over the years. Um, so my number one focus right now with those properties is uh, soundproofing. Yeah. Um, so I've really, uh, you know, I, I really dug into the soundproofing world and, and um, I've learned a ton there. And um, so any project that I've started doing like i think it was three years ago or whatever i put a very heavy uh, emphasis on soundproofing yeah are, are you also trying to separate you know heating and cooling within the units i mean if i can sure but if if not it's not the end of the world yeah i mean and, and I, i'm doing that especially i find that's our biggest kind of issue so anything any new unit that i've built or created yeah. you know going back the last almost four years, we built separate, at least separate cooling. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there's, you know, a, a heating system that does the whole building. Yeah. But at least separate cooling and separate hydrometers for sure. Oh yeah. Hydro, hydrometers, that's a hundred percent. Yeah. Like right. you want to separate as much as you possibly can. Within reason. Within reason. But anything, anything that should be separated, you should sep- like you separate it, right? Yeah. I think on those kind of things, at least in my mind, there's always an ROI calculation. And, and you, part of that ROI calculation, in my view, is actually the, the, ten, the, the comfort of the tenant. Because if you can make the tenant more comfortable uh, by having their own hydrometer, not having to worry about someone else shutting it off or having their own uh, hydro, the electrical panel, having their own uh, water meter or gas meter, mm-hmm. having their own heating and cooling system, yes, it's an extra cost. But if they're more comfortable, they will pay more and you will attract a better tenant. And, you know, even though it may cost more to install, if you can measure the increase in rent, there's actually an ROI. So if you can say, I spent an extra 10,000 separating the heating and the cooling and having an extra hydrometer, but I can charge an extra $200 a month in rent, that's 2,400 a year. And I'm going to recover that 10 grand Mm -hmm. in four years. And the property is more valuable and the unit is more valuable and I'm attracting a better tenant. It makes sense. But if the cost yeah. is 50 grand and I'm only going to make a hundred dollars a month, mm-hmm. maybe it's not worth it. Well, there's, there's an ROI component, like a math, that's the math component. But what about mitigating the risk of tenant disputes? Yeah. Emails, text messages, phone calls, mm-hmm. LTB, right? Like, I've, I've seen it all, by the way, I, I've, I've gone, sure yeah, I, I, I mean, we don't have to talk about more, more of my nightmare stories, but, um, at the end of the day, 
like, yes, there's the math component, but if you set things up properly for right from the beginning, you will have more sleep and more peace of mind, yeah. a better relationship with your tenants. Mm -hmm. The tenants will have better relationships amongst themselves. And at the end of the day, like you're selling a product. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a product and a service. It's actually both, right? It's a, pro it's a physical product and it's a, ser it's a service. Yeah. I, I, I kind of wrap that stuff in with tenants comfort. You know what I mean? Like if, if that can be avoided for a marginal cost and I get the mathematical ROI, mm -hmm. it's a no brainer. Like you, you gotta be an idiot not to do it. Yeah. At that point. I, you know, that's, that's smart. Plus, plus there's another factor. So let's say immigration numbers decline, right? Let's say, I don't know, nothing can stay up here forever, right? Demand for units. Decline. Yes. What goes up must come down. So may, maybe in 10 years from now, they come up with a new way to build, I don't know, tiny homes by the tens of thousands per year, whatever, some communist blocks, right? They, they're going to build like Soviet Union style blocks. And now there's like the demand for rentals is going to decrease, right? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? You built a, a, a better quality unit. You have a better qu uh, product than your competitors. And you're, you're going to be able to get a decent tenant where other, other competitors, other landlords may have to drop their price. Yeah. They may have to take a tenant they don't want to take just to fill it for the sake of filling it. And now we go back into this vicious, whole vicious cycle of like less desirable tenant. They have their own issues, blah, 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 right? So... Yeah, I, I, we had that situation actually happen. We built, we, we in, also in St. Catharines, we did a small infill development. We, it was a crappy bungalow. We bought the lot, knocked the house down and built a semi-detached property. But each semi had its own basement suite. Yes. So it was like two duplexes attached to each yeah. other. But we own both. So call it a fourplex, call it two duplexes, whatever. Yeah. And in order to make the deal work, we had to get a certain amount of rent. And our neighbors thought we were insane for charging the amount of rent we did because it was the highest the, the street had seen uh, and probably may ever see because it's the nicest property on the block, right? At this point, because they're yeah. kind of smaller wartime bungalows. Yeah. But we got it and we got it very quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of exactly what you're describing, the offering we had was a nice one bedroom apartment. Instead of a crammed two bedroom, we did, I changed the design last minute to be a nice one bedroom with a huge walk-in closet, a nice open kitchen with an island, mm -hmm. a huge, huge window in the living room, a nice proper bathroom, all tiled, mm -hmm. nice one bedroom space rather than a crammed two bedroom. And it doesn't feel like a basement, right? It doesn't feel like a basement. Yeah. Big windows, separate heating, separate cooling, separate hydrometer, so the, separate laundry, yeah. separate entrance, separate closet. So they had... That's, that's also scarcity. Who, who offers that? There was nothing on the street, in the neighborhood, or even in the entire marketplace of St. Catharines that could meet that for that price. Yeah. You got it like that. Yeah. I've, I, 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 I know it works. I've seen, I've seen something like that before and it's mind boggling how much rent you can charge. Yeah. And, and it, it's not like we charged where market rent was. 1200 and we charged 2500 for the same unit. Mm -hmm. Like we got about 20 to 25% more of the market, but we needed to because we built, we built this unit from scratch, brand new. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it costs a lot of money. Like I'm not getting yeah. into the numbers, but it's, it was significant cost. So did you, did you have the high ceilings too? 10 foot ceilings? Uh, nine foot ceilings. Nine foot ceilings. So there, there you go. Yeah. Show me a basement unit in St. Cat. Like there's maybe a handful in the whole city and i have four of them yeah <laughs> yeah there you go that's a handful right yeah. there uh anyhow okay no but it makes sense 100 percent. the airbnb still work for you there is i would say a niche what i call a niche market in ontario where you can still do that uh you can be wild west and do it wherever the hell you want anymore because you're just asking for trouble yeah but there is a niche market that works and you, you're doing it well and i want other people to understand that uh, what i mean t it's 2024 I mean, what do you see coming up in the future? Like, what would you do investment-wise if, if you're in buying or investing in Ontario in the next, you know, one, two years, given what, what's going on with e economics, politics, all that kind of good stuff? Like, what's your opinion? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, a housing crisis still. Uh, it's not going away anytime soon. Um, 
the what's the statistic on new building permits like it's decli- the the building permits are declining the population is growing um we're already in a housing crisis mm-hmm. um so if there's ways for you to get your hands on properties where you can let's say convert a single family home into three units i think that's the play right now is like uh instead of a one to two like the um the old school way of doing things you know, you buy a bungalow and convert into duplex. Uh, the new play now is you buy a bungalow with a garage attached to it and you turn it into a triplex mm-hmm. for, for like lower level. And if you can get your hands on a bigger lot, maybe you can like a corner lot, you can sever it. Um, or I've, I've seen a property in Welland, it was a triplex um, and it could be converted into a fiveplex without any additions. Wow. So within the existing structure. Why didn't you call me? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I unfortunately I got I got uh, outbid on that. That was that was during COVID too. But yeah, anything like that where you can add two two units, that's when the math will work. Mm-hmm. The numbers will make sense even in this high interest uh, environment. Um, and that's kind of what I'm looking at right now. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's the smartest thing to do. And for those who are new or beginner or kind of just thinking about real estate. That might sound like an advanced type of strategy. I would call it intermediate at this point because there's a lot of people doing it. And it is available. We're talking a lot about Niagara because we both have properties there, but that strategy can be done in Toronto, Hamilton, Kitchener, Waterloo, Barrie, basically anywhere in the Southern GTA, these properties exist. Yeah. Some yeah. some cities are more favorable, like they're easier to work with. C- correct. I'm just saying the type yeah. of the type of properties where this can be done, they exist almost everywhere in, in oh, yeah. Ontario. So it, it can be done. I just want to make that clear. Um, but for those who are new beginner, who may, maybe that's a little bit, uh, that's a lot to bite off on your first go. You know, it's my opinion. And you tell me if you agree that if you're going to start with something, maybe a duplex or like a bungalow with a basement apartment, mm-hmm. I say is your best bet to start, even though it's probably more difficult to find. I think if you put the effort in and you you have the right representation, the realtor, by the way, we can help you. Uh, uh, like to do that, it's gonna it's it's in your best interest mm-hmm. rather than going for like the typical condo in the sky. And I'm not saying condos are bad. I'm just saying in Canada they kind of are. They kind of are. But I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I know people who make good money with yeah. And there is a way to do it. Yes. I'm just saying, if you have a choice, if you have a choice between I can buy this condo for five, six, seven hundred K, or I can go a little bit further out and buy a, a bungalow for five, six, seven hundred K that has a basement apartment where I can rent up and down or convert it. Like I take the single family with a, a, the second unit. Because it has more options, right? More options, more income, more, more flexibility, more control, no friggin' condo board. Yeah. I mean, if the condo is the only thing you can afford and that's in your price range, something is better than nothing. And I don't mean to crap on condos. I, I, lit- I coach people who have multiple condos and do very well. Some with short-term rental also. I'm just saying if you yeah. have that short- Well, and they're in the market. They're, they're, in, they're in the market. They're, they're in the game, right? Yeah. yeah. You'd be surprised that if you're in the game and you have people around you who can help you and you have good networks like ours, you can make money doing basically any strategy you want. It's just a matter of you focusing and choosing the right one that makes sense. What do you think about that? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, condos were never appealing to me here in Canada in, in general for, for multiple reasons. But like you said, um, you know, at some of the networking events you run into condo investors, they've, that's their focus. That's their strategy. And a hundred percent, there's opportunities there The people have made a, sh- a ton of money and there's, there's still opportunities there. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not for me, right? Yeah, no, it's not for me. Totally. All right. Any, any closing thoughts, any advice, something you'd like to, like if you were, if you were talking to your, you know, yourself 10 years ago, you know, to someone who's just looking to get in here, you know, what would you tell them? Just take action. Just do it. I, as you can tell, <laughs> I've made... I don't know how many mistakes I've made over the years, um, but I took action. And uh, yeah, w- what's what's your what's your biggest regret as an investor? Your your biggest regret is like, oh, I should have I should have bought more. I should have started buying earlier or sooner. Mm-hmm. Those those are the two big regrets because it, it was on, it was on my mind. I mean, it took me. 
I, I told Tom and, and Nick this too. It's like, it took me a year to research Rockstar before I joined because I was so skeptical, overthinking everything. Oh, they want my money, blah, blah, blah. What, what, what a, it turns out I was such a fool, right? To do that. Yeah. I wasted a whole year. I could have, I could have met you a year sooner, right? Yeah, we all made those mistakes. So, so that, that's the, the biggest one. Um, and, and I see this all the time, right? Like I, when I talk to people who are less experienced or they, they ask me questions, just, just do it. Just get your feet wet. Get your feet wet. All right. And I, I, if you are in the marketplace, uh, you know, you don't have to just buy the first property you see. I mean, we, we have systems set up for people who are new beginner, maybe you have a, a uh, a property that you moved out of and you kept it as a rental, but you want to do more because you saw how much equity you built. You know, people who want to move up, who are in the beginner stage, you want to move up to the intermediate stage or intermediates to do more, more advanced things like we do. You know, we have systems and mentorships and coaching kind of built in for these kind of people. So we, we want you to reach out to us and fill out our uh, application uh, questionnaire so we know kind of where you're sitting and we're happy to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with you and uh, see how we can help kind of mold your strategy and push you forward to where you want to go. That's kind of our specialty and what we do. So with that, Christian, I, I want to thanks. Thank you for sharing your story. Thanks for having me. I think people are going to find that valuable. Cool. Thanks. Take care. You too.